So my name is uh, Carl Kreider, and we're going to be presenting mostly on Grid Plus tonight. Uh, Igor is going to introduce uh, consensus briefly here at the beginning. And just to kind of give an overview of what Grid Plus is, to kind of let you chew on it as, as we, we go through the slide deck, is Grid Plus is creating the world's first blockchain-based retail electricity provider or utility. And what that means is that our customers will use the blockchain to buy, sell, and settle for their electricity in real time uh, using the blockchain. And so we're gonna talk about how we're gonna do that and what benefits it has tonight. So uh, first, we'll hand it off to Igor to talk a little bit about Consensus. Cool, thanks, Carl. Um, so Consensus, uh, you may have heard of us. We are a collective our, our mothership is in, is in Bushwick, New York. Um, if you're ever in Bushwick and getting pizza at Roberta's, uh, feel free to come on over. Um, we are a company that started in October of 2013 um, and really you know, uh, started with a lot of folks who, who kind of understood Bitcoin um, and who realized that the, the blockchain technology is not just um, an interesting technology, but it's in fact, you know, uh, a technology that has revolutionary implications on um, our society, our economy, and, you know, our political systems as well. Um, you know, with blockchain technology and the censorship resistance that is embedded, you know, in the technology, um, we now have this kind of trust layer um, that we've never had in, in human society before. Right, so um, really, a lot of a lot of the early consensus members and, and you know members that come in today, we spend a lot of time uh, really talking about the implications of the technology and, and what the real kind of underlying meaning of blockchain is in the long term. Um, now, all that said, we're also a business, right? So we have to make money, um, and we do that in, in three ways. So. Um, the first way, when I joined, I, uh, Mark and I helped uh, kind of co-found Consensus Enterprise. So we do consulting advisory services for um, companies all over the world. We have partnerships with folks like uh, Microsoft, folks like Deloitte. Um, we've done engagements with you know massive companies like BHP Billiton. Um, we have been named the blockchain city advisor to the city of Dubai, so we're helping Dubai. Um, with their mandate to get on block, get all government documents on the blockchain by 2020, um, and that's you know that's one side of our business where we're actually providing services and advisory um, to to the world as it starts to adopt and understand blockchain technology. Um, we also build infrastructure for the Ethereum um, blockchain, the network of Ethereum-based applications. Um, our Ethereum as a service platform in Fura, and we're doing over a billion requests per day on the Ethereum network. Um, our developer tools, um, Truffle Suite, uh, has over 120,000 developer downloads, um, and our in-browser uh, Chrome extension, MetaMask, has over 150,000 installs. Um, so one of the things that, that uh, is really exciting about Consensus and about the work that we're doing is we actually see the adoption of blockchain technology day in and day out. It took Google search engine five years uh, to hit a billion requests in one day. Uh, we've done it in less than, well, a little over than a year with Infura, but it took us a year to get to a billion requests and we're, we're growing and we're growing. Um, and so that's, you know, a little bit about consensus. The, the, on the infrastructure stack. Finally, the products. Um, you know, we build products, we build uh, companies, uh, we build services. Um, Grid Plus is, is one of one of the products that we're most excited for. Um, and as we'll talk about, you know, it's actually um, bringing blockchain technology into into the physical world, into consumers' homes. Um, and, and we're really, you know, we're really advancing this technology to its next stage. Um, so the revolution is just beginning, so uh, stay tuned. So thanks, Igor. So with all that um, 
sort of scope in mind, uh, the first question that you have to ask yourself is why did we choose energy as a, an area to focus on? And the reason that we chose energy, or one of the reasons, is that climate change is threatening mankind. And we need to collectively uh, figure out how to build clean energy systems uh, that don't use carbon. And I guess that's especially pertinent uh, in this location because I believe we're sitting about two meters uh, below sea level. And so uh, we see blockchain as, as a, a catalyzing technology to help move past the current uh, electrical grid to the future electrical grid. So the promise of renewables, so solar, wind, and energy storage can enable us to move past uh, carbon-based fuels. Uh, it's been relatively recently that they've actually been economically viable uh, technologies. But more recently, if you look at solar, even in a residential installation, it can produce energy for uh, seven or eight cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, total uh, levelized cost of, of production. If we look at batteries, batteries now can uh, allow us to store energy to increase the amount of intermittent renewable production that we have, and that it can do it as low as uh, 12 cents per warranty kilowatt hour. So what that means is that in many markets throughout the world, not necessarily the Netherlands, but many markets, uh, even today with no further reductions in cost in solar and energy storage, these are not only economically viable technologies, but they're actually the cheapest way uh, to have electricity in your home. And the unfortunate part about that, though, is that the integration of these systems creates challenges uh, for the electrical grid. And one of those challenges is that they don't generate all the time. And in the world of electricity, you have to essentially be able to match supply or generation and demand or load continuously and instantaneously. So currently in the, in the electrical grid, we don't um, have a lot of storage. So if that supply exceeds demand, you'll get a spike in voltage, which can damage equipment. And if uh, you get the inverse, you'll get a sag in voltage, which can also damage equipment. So in the world of electricity markets, there's something uh, called an independent system operator, or ISO, in a deregulated market. And what they're tasked with doing is essentially making sure that we can have supply instantaneously always match demand, such that we can have reliable and, and safe electricity at the voltages and frequencies that we expect. And so, um, the renewables create uh, an extra challenge for them because of the intermittency in the generation. So uh, sort of the peak production of solar, you can see uh, this sort of graph from California happens midday and then it falls off uh, kind of when demand is peaking. And so what that does is it makes all of the other actors on the grid have to essentially make up for the fact that they're solar. So there's this sort of externality that's implied to everybody else in the system by putting a solar panel up. It's great because it's green technology, but it creates a cost and it creates a technical challenge for everybody else. So the utilities and in the utility space, we're actually here uh, this week in Amsterdam because we're going to uh, European Utility Week. One of our colleagues, uh, John, just spoke uh, tonight uh, right before the meetup and, and also did a panel uh, talking about uh, blockchain and in the energy space. And uh, the energy companies and the utilities are sort of coming to terms with this idea of what's known as the transactive grid. And what the transactive grid is historically, uh, the electrical grid was a very top-down system. So you, you had your very large generators, they move the electricity through the transmission and distribution system, um, and then you have essentially people that buy the energy out of that market and then sell it to the consumer, but, but it's a, a top-down flow. And with the introduction of uh, what we call distributed energy resources being localized solar production, uh, storage, uh, solar being you know, production, storage being batteries, the, the uh, utilities are challenged sort of with how to deal with those resources and how to uh, essentially fairly adjudicate the economic uh, productive you know, uh, utility that these resources have. And, and 
and they also need to then be able to control and respond or have those resources respond to, to the markets. And so the transactive energy or the, the word transactive energy or the transactive grid is essentially the confluence of IoT with these uh, distributed energy resources. So why does blockchain sort of come into this picture? Uh, we're moving towards this idea of this renewable distributed uh, future of energy. So where, where does blockchain fit in? And the reason blockchain fits in is because it creates the financial layer, which is complementary to uh, the transactive grid, right? So in the transactive grid world, you have all of these assets that are independently owned, independently financed, that have to interact with each other and are adding some degree of value to the system in net. Right? So in the pr previous world, we had this strictly top-down thing, and, and we could very easily sort of collateralize all the financial intermediaries. But in the new world, where you have independent people financing these relatively small productive assets, but then needing to monetize them over time, it's very difficult to allow that to happen in this distributed system and using a traditional financial layer. And so as we move towards more and more of these distributed assets and we need them to be able to interact not just with some you know, centralized financial intermediary but actually each other, that's where blockchain can come in to make the system uh, sort of efficient. I'll let you do this one. Sure. Yeah. I can talk about it. Great. Great. Um, <laughs> so I've been with Consensus for about two years. Uh, I started at the Enterprise Group along with Igor, his brother John, uh, and one of his brothers, and others at 85 people in that group. Uh, we've done a lot of cool stuff, including the energy space, which we'll get to. In the early days, one of the first projects Consensus actually did was called, I think, the Transactive Grid. It was a joint venture with L3 Energy. It was in Brooklyn. If you guys ever read about the Brooklyn Microgrid project, that was us. Uh, it was actually written by Dr. Christian Lundquist, who's the lead of Viewport. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Viewport, but it's our identity management platform. Uh, so between Christian and John Willis, they kind of wrote out all the code and built out this Brooklyn Microgrid, which is really cool thinking about how can you tokenize uh, excess photovoltaic energy and create an idea of a prosumer and allow them to transact directly with one of their neighbors in a small microgrid setting. Um, Probably wasn't a scalable solution. We didn't have many of the things that we have now. We didn't have things like Truffle. We didn't have things like Infura. Like load balancing on the network was difficult. Creating our own private instantiations of Ethereum was difficult. It was really early days. And what we built wasn't really a scalable solution, but it was a really good like starting point that we can learn from. Um, a couple months later, or maybe a year later, we started working with RWE, which split out to become Energy. Karsten Soccer, he's a great thinker in the space. He's really fantastic. Started working on a platform called Cotricity. Uh, essentially, it was doing something somewhat similar with prosumers, allowing them to sell to local um, local companies like grocery stores in a given area, use leveraging the actual infrastructure of the grid, no microgrid in that situation. Again, we started playing around with it, we started building solutions, um, learned a whole bunch about you know, this energy ecosystem. We actually took a lot of that knowledge and started working with our enterprise clients because I mean, our inbound interest is kind of insane from every Fortune 500 in the world. And we, we ended up closing a very large um, build out with, call it one of the energy megas, one of the top six companies in the world. For the next 11 months, I actually was working on that platform with our other co-founder in Grid Plus, uh, Alex Miller, who is the lead developer. And what we did was we networked together a bunch of smart batteries, um, repurposed their private keys on there so they can do ECDSA signatures, so they can actually make Ethereum trans transactions. We built multiple decentralized exchanges. And this is before like decentralized exchanges became the hot rage, like zero X out there and swap protocol and stuff like that. Uh, we built full order books on chain, which is definitely not scalable, really horrible, terrible when it comes to gas costs and everything else. But again, it was a great learning experience. Uh, we did that for nearly a year. That project actually looks like it's going to be moving forward, which you'll probably hear about that in the coming, I don't know, couple of months is my guess. Um, and we took a lot of that knowledge and we started thinking about what could we actually do to tangibly like, affect the energy ecosystem now. Um, and at that point, we, we called upon Carl, who was one of Alex's buddies at, at UT Austin. And Carl's like, hey, he, I know he'll be bashful about it, but he's a really, really talented guy when it comes to like smart batteries. He, he does a lot of work with... Uh, you know, large format lithium ion batteries where we were currently networking together and trying to figure out how can we build something within the current uh, infrastructure um, where a blockchain will actually make sense and offer some value. That's kind of the genesis idea of how Grid Plus came to be. And uh, we started really kicking it off in maybe February, March of this year. Um, yeah, so we can go to the next. Uh, do you want to talk about this, there? Yeah, sure, I'll take it. 
So, so kind of to um, elaborate where uh, Mark was going, so we said to ourselves, what is the actual value that we can bring to the electricity markets with the current infrastructure, meaning there aren't many locations that have high penetration of both uh, renewable energy, say solar and batteries. Uh, part of it has to do with how the economic incentives are currently set up, and part of it has to do with uh, the cost of batteries until about this year. Uh, but what we determined was there's really three opportunities, right? The most um, immediate opportunity was essentially to create a, a new form of an energy retailer uh, to allow customers to have much lower energy prices, but to also expose them to wholesale pricing, which actually allows uh, market economics to be better reflected and responded to by the consumer. And so that's really what Grid Plus is addressing. There's also another opportunity that we see with uh, commoditizing and trading renewable energy credits. I won't really get into that. Uh, but the long-term goal is still kind of trying to get to this idea of P2P trading of energy. And we see putting uh, the financial infrastructure in place uh, that we're talking about with Grid Plus as the first step that then can be incrementally developed to make it to the point, say, 10 years in the future, where everybody does have a battery, a solar panel, and is, is trading energy uh, with each other. And so how do we capitalize on these opportunities? Uh, Mark kind of mentioned some of the work we're doing uh, with the large energy companies, but the other thing that we're focusing on uh, is, is creating Grid Plus, uh, which will be that retail energy provider or utility uh, in Texas starting next year. So I just wanted, oh, you want to do this one? No, you can do this one. Just no. really quickly, um, one of the things Carl said about exposing consumers to wholesale pricing, like just because I'm, I'm sure not many people here are energy market experts. Uh, the way it currently works is like your utility buys from the wholesale market to their day and night or in real time, and then they sell it to all their customers. And typically, they've been buying in Texas around six cents a kilowatt hour, and they're selling it for about 12 cents. So it's 100% markup for a company that literally just takes care of billing. So when, when Carl's saying if we expose the customers to wholesale pricing, we can incentivize these uh, these dirts to come online, like batteries and solar, it's because we give them access to the wholesale markets. So if energy becomes really expensive, maybe they don't buy. Or if energy is really abundant on the grid at this different point, and it's either you know free or even negative in certain situations, they'll pull energy from the grid and they'll charge their batteries. So by offering them free markets, um, we incentivize people to actually put on solar panels and, and distributed batteries, which improves the infrastructure of the grid. Uh, and, and so I, I just kind of want to highlight this. So we've basically thrown out this idea of we're creating a utility, and, and that comes with a lot of maybe ideas in people's heads in terms of what it may take to create uh, a retail electricity provider. And, and so I need to make a distinction between what are known as regulated markets and deregulated markets. And so all energy markets in the world or electricity markets kind of fall into one, two of these categories. In a regulated market, the entire supply chain is controlled essentially by some form of government sanctioned monopoly. So generation, transmission, distribution, and, and, and retailing. And in these situations, it's basically impossible unless you have full buy-in from that entity to come in and, and sort of implement a new technology. What we're focusing on at Grid Plus is something called a deregulated market. In a deregulated market, uh, the generation is a competitive business, the uh, retailing is a competitive business, and there's regulation uh, and, uh, and non-competitiveness within transmission and distribution. So essentially in a deregulated market, we can come in, create our own uh, retail energy provider. We don't have to have regulations change. We don't have to have infrastructural changes. We fit within the existing framework. Uh, and yeah, I just want to highlight that. So just, you know, you'll, yeah. So, so this is just to give more of a, an overview and to highlight the fact that we don't actually have any physical electrical infrastructure that we're putting in place. If we look at the four main entities within a deregulated market, you have generation, which are your large scale producers, say coal fired power plants, industrial scale solar. Uh, you have transmission, which is your long distance uh, transmission of electricity. You have distribution, which are your low voltage lines within a city. And then you have the retailing. And if you look at this graph here, the 
actual infrastructure is from the generators through the transmission and distribution system to the customers, and the retailer, which is where Grid Plus sits, is above the actual infrastructure layer. So it's strictly an administrative layer that buys energy out of these wholesale markets that the generators sell into, repackages that energy, sells it to the consumer, and then pays a fee to the transmission distribution operators. So it's literally a financial intermediary with no sort of infrastructural requirements on the grid. And as uh, Mark mentioned earlier, they currently charge about 100% markup. You wanna do this one? What yeah. is it? This is the breakdown of the debt. Okay, sure. Yeah. So current utilities are not super differentiated. Um, and it's actually funny, if I ask the crowd, how many utilities do you think actually exist in Texas right now? Does anyone want to take a guess? Much easier. How many utilities, how many retailers selling energy to customers? Seven, okay, so it's about 110, so, yeah. So like, there's been like wealthy ex-athletes who just sign up customers and spin up one of these reps and they like plug into someone else's, you know, billing, it's, it's really not all that. Sounds like ICOs. Yeah, sounds like ICOs, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, it's really not that they to become a rep, anyone can really do it, you can close like a million dollars in escrow, they spend a lot of money on marketing, um, that's actually like half of their, they spend outside of cost of electricity and, and for distribution and the, uh, and transmission. Um, so basically what that means is they're going out and they're trying to give you like, here's a free Nest thermostat or something, sign up with us for the next six months. Um, and they do all these campaigns to get people on board. In Texas, we typically see about 30% churn um, each year, which is higher than other regions. Um, but it is a competitive market wherein on a quarterly basis, like ERCOT publishes out, here's every utility in your region, here's their average cost of the lot hours that they're charging you. And we think we can actually compete on price because we can offer a much more efficient solution when it comes to actually billing um, our customers. So, like I said, we're actually, re you know, one, one important piece of, we're, we're reducing bad debts, like, basically to zero. Uh, we require prepayment of energy. We don't want to operate as a credit facility. Um, we can talk about how we actually do that with our agent device, but basically your customer will prepay for either one month, two months, three months of energy in advance. We tokenize that payment, drop it onto their agent device, and then every 15 minutes as they're consuming energy, they're actually just making a signed UCDSA signature on the state channel to update the balance of how much they owe us. Uh, it's a relatively efficient solution. As of current cost, like pre-Metropolis, pre EIP-186, pre, pre all the other advances we're gonna get, it might be like 15 to 18 cents to open and close the state channel. So it's not super expensive for something that, you know, two transactions every couple of months. Maybe that's it. Yeah, so I, I, just, I just kind of want to add in that idea of bad debt. So one, one of the major costs that retailers uh, incur is essentially uh, non-payment from customers. And they have to amateurize that non-payment across their entire customer base. So if you have a 4% essentially default rate, amateurizing that across your customer base on your margin actually takes up 25% of what you're charging above the cost of electricity. So by having, uh, as Mark said, prepayment, but what is actually a real-time payment, you're eliminating that issue of bad debts, which means you can eliminate that cost. We also think we can eliminate about 25% of the administrative cost, which has to do with uh, hedging, as, as well as uh, some of the financial inefficiencies that exist. Uh, so we can eliminate roughly 35% of, 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 their, of their cost above the cost of electricity. And in doing that, you have this cost competitive structural advantage. You can then offer the lowest price electricity and then you synergistically get uh, savings in marketing because you're just the lowest price provider in the market. Uh, but to enable all of these opportunities and to use blockchain to settle for electricity in real time, we need to create a system architecture that allows a consumer to naively use a blockchain-based asset. We also have to create a seamless customer experience and kind of uh, what Mark highlighted just a second ago is we have to have a mechanism for fast and cheap microtransactions. So this is roughly the system architecture. Um, there's a many components here. The only three that are needed from essentially day one is what we call our smart energy agent, our customer smartphone, uh, a Wi-Fi hub, or a wi you know, they have to have access to uh, uh, a Wi-Fi router, and then, um, and then uh, Grid Plus, basically. 
And so within the home, there's all these extra add-ons that can eventually be added, uh, as we've alluded to, like a Nest thermostat or uh, uh, photovoltaics or batteries. But initially, they just need the smartphone, the smart energy agent, and the internet. Uh, and we're creating a system where we delocalize our keys so that we're in a natively multi-signature system. So one key is sitting on an agent, one uh, key is sitting on a customer's smartphone, and one key is, uh, exists with Grid Plus. So um, before we kind of explain the uh, sort of security topology more, um, I'm just going to kind of highlight the functionality of uh, the smart energy agent beyond just being able to uh, create signatures and, and settle transactions on Ethereum. Some of the other things that it brings to the customers is that it's actually making the buying decisions on the customer's behalf. So it is predicting uh, customer use based off information that we get from the smartphone app via, say, GPS data and or, say, calendar data, which is uh, securely shared with just that customer's agent which then learns that customer's habit and then predicts their future uh, electricity requirements. It then decides how to buy energy out of the day ahead markets or the real time markets. The day ahead markets are typically the cheaper way to buy energy, but you need to know what your consumption is gonna be in the future. So you, you have to have a, a decent idea of what you're gonna use and that's one of the uh, things that the agent does. And then it can also buy energy out of the real-time markets, but that's typically more expensive and more volatile. So the better you can predict your future energy use, the lower and less volatile price uh, you'll get. So normal or traditional retail electricity providers will uh, basically do this in aggregate for their entire customer base. But what we're doing is we're creating a customized solution for each individual that changes based off of those customers' habits, but also their schedule and, and their GPS data. So you can actually have a much better uh, prediction, potentially, of their future use. And you can actually, if you have other assets, you can control those in a much better way. Um, so next slide. So I'm, I'm just gonna, well, no, I, I really like this slide, actually. I'm not gonna be brief about this one. I love this slide. Um, so what we've introduced here is something that we call two of three blind key multi-signature security. And what we're trying to do with a two of three multi-sig wallet, we're really addressing a, a software security issue, right? If you have a private key and this private key is always online, you, you have sort of this high uh, uh, surface for attack from, from a software vector. But one thing that people don't really consider when looking at cryptocurrencies and looking at blockchain-based assets in real mass use is a physical attack vector. And so one thing that we kind of, or I came up with this to kind of highlight this fact is uh, this little cartoon here. And what it says is in the crypto nerds and imagination, you have your Ethereum hardware wallet and you have an H digit pin and somebody comes in to steal your, your, your money and they find your hardware wallet and they're like, oh shoot, we're foiled. We can't you know, get through your, your Ledger S Nano because you got this eight digit pin on it. Uh, but what would really happen is that they would see the hardware wallet and they'd say, hey, this guy probably has a backup card somewhere. So if anyone's ever, how, how many people have used a hardware wallet of some sort, right? All of these hardware wallets have some 12, 18, 24 word backup that exists as just plain text on a piece of paper. And many of us, maybe, that just raised their hand, might have that backup in their sock drawer. So a smart attacker would actually not say, oh shoot, we're, we're foiled because I can't, don't have the pin for the Ledger S or the Ledger Nano is, um, they would just go to the sock drawer and look for the, for the plain text card. Now, obviously, some people are shaking their heads saying, no, of course I wouldn't keep my backup phrase in, in, in my sock drawer. But it highlights an interesting problem. And that interesting problem is that your ability to physically secure your digital assets actually comes back to your ability to physically secure them in the real world. So it could be manifested as this, you know, 24 digit or this, this 24 letter thing. You could break it up, you could put it in a book, whatever, but fundamentally it comes back to your ability to secure that in physical space. 
So that actually creates a terrible topology that we haven't had to really deal with since gold, right? And if you think about cryptocurrency sort of taking off and proliferating, that's not a tenable situation to build the new financial system of the future is that everybody's money is based off how well they can physically secure it. That's just really, really bad. And so when we're looking at saying putting cryptocurrency into people's homes, number one, but also putting cryptocurrency into people's homes that don't actually know that they have it, number two, we can't have that be a tenable situation that we've just put a device in their home that could be stolen or creates essentially a honeypot with you know thousands of dollars on it for somebody to come and steal. So we had to create a system that's not only reliable and robust and is always online, but is, always, but is also answering this issue of, of physical uh, security. And so that's where this idea of a blind key comes in. So in a normal two of three multi-signature application, who, who knows of two of three multi-signature? Everybody up with that? Okay, so I'll just two seconds. Two of three multi-signature wallets, basically, instead of requiring one private key to create a transaction and send funds, you have to have a majority of keys uh, create a transaction and to send funds. So uh, the simplest version of that is having two out of three keys uh, sign a transaction to send it. So in a normal system, say BitGo, for example, a customer has a smartphone app, and then you have BitGo, and the customer would originate a transaction, send it to BitGo, they would co-sign it, send it to the chain. In our system, we have a variation upon that, where instead of having the customer have two keys, which potentially exist in plain text, one of the keys we create only exists on the hardware agent, and it exists as what we call a blind key. So there's no backup to it. Uh, if you actually get to the agent, you're not going to be able to pull the key off of the agent. And the other key exists on the smartphone with the backup, and then we have the third key. So what's now happened, though, by blinding that key, the customer still has both keys in their possession, but without, say, a pin code for their agent, they can't actually spend any large amount of funds off of that agent. And I'll talk about a couple more things that we add in later. Um, if you go down. Oh, well, I'll talk about it now. So uh, a couple of things that we add in in addition to that is, is something we call a secure computing enclave. So, so the key actually exists on a secure signing enclave, which is essentially a finance grade mechanism to store private keys. It's very similar to a SIM card uh, that you have uh, in, in your phone or on a, uh, a pinned uh, credit card. And they have very limited programmability, so they have a very low uh, software attack surface. It's, it's basically non-existent. And they're also very secure to physical attacks. So even if you get your hands on one of these, these devices and say you decap the chip and you use a microscope to try to see what's there, even that is very difficult to do, even for nation states. So it's, a, it's essentially a physically secure key. What we also do, though, is we introduce this idea of the secure computing environment. The secure computing environment is then responsible for whitelisting addresses. It's responsible for ensuring uh, or, or enforcing account limits. And what that does is if you have just the signing enclave, right? If I can compromise this general computing environment, I can get the signing enclave to sign anything if it's directly connected. Even though I don't have the private key, I can still get it to sign a message that I didn't want it to sign. But if you have this intermediary secure computing enclave, you can enforce account permissionings and you can enforce whitelisting, and you can enforce uh, withdrawal limits. That also actually removes one of the physical attack vectors, because if we go back to the customer having two keys, one of which is pin protected, we've actually created a system that's much like uh, a bank card, because you could actually, if who knows what the $5 wrench attack is? Who's heard about that? So the $5 wrench attack was uh, kind of an inspiration for the sock drawer attack, and basically what that says is that if you have a password, the way that that password is going to be broken isn't through, you know, some force of, or isn't through uh, computational, uh, you know, trial and error, rather through its coercion of a person. And so the $5 wrench attack says if we need to get somebody's pin, we just beat them with a $5 wrench until they tell us their pin. So we've answered all the questions except for that $5 wrench attack because um, if you have two keys, one of them has been protected, you could just go in and beat the person to get their, their money. But if you have withdrawal limits, 
and account permissioning, that actually is no longer a tax factor and you actually end up in a situation much like an ATM card. Many people have an ATM card in this room but aren't worried about walking down the street and getting beaten for their PIN so that somebody can go to an ATM and take cash out. And the reason for that is because they know that they only can get a few hundred euros. So the incentive isn't there. So we've now created a system which is similar to uh, the, the physical sort of attack vector of an ATM card, and it's also robust to software attack vectors, and it's also delocalized in that the keys don't exist in any one uh, physical location, so if something happens, you don't uh, lose your funds. You can help by this one. How, how are we on time? Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, really quickly on Vault. But yeah, sure. Uh, bolts when when our customers prepay us uh, with dollars, uh, you know, whether it's like a wire, uh, ACH payment, or credit card payment, we tokenize that as bolts and we put them on their agent device. So it's really just a representation of US dollars, fully collateralized and backed in a bank account that we don't touch for anything else. Um, when people pay uh, for energy in real time, that's being paid in these bolt tokens. We use Alex Miller's EIP621, maybe, which is a provable burn function, we remove the bolt out of uh, the ecosystem, then we're free to use those dollars to pay for the energy in the wholesale market. Um, that's bolt. So, so just real quick on that, though. So just, just real quick on that. So uh, customers will be able to pay in Ethereum if they would like. Um, and the thing is we just understand that 95% of our customers, if we want to have mass acceptance, 97% uh, of our customers uh, won't, be, uh, won't be crypto nerds, won't be willing to sort of take on the Forex risk or the technical challenges associated with uh, Ethereum today. So that is why we have the Bolt is essentially bridge to allow mass adoption and the benefits of blockchain and cryptocurrencies without actually having the users to understand that they're there. You can skip this. I think yeah, we, we can, can skip that. this. Yeah, You can skip that one too. Skip that one too. Talk about that. Yeah, sure. So <laughs> the agent device uh, could potentially be used for many other things outside of just paying for energy in real time. Like I said, it has a general compute environment. We can also have to like an SD card or give it some kind of uh, storage or memory. And then at that point, we can do really cool things like maybe decentralize Infura. Uh, Igor mentioned Infura before. Like, it's a centralized service that consensus is just giving to the ecosystem and processing 1.2 billion requests per day. That's expensive on the cloud side. Um, what would happen? And it's also like a centralized service, right? It's a load balancing for the entire network. All the DAP endpoints kind of point to to Infura that we run, and then we, we balance across the network. It'd be really cool if we we're running like an Infura node on each of these agent devices. Same idea with, uh, with IPF Pass, right? Maybe you just set up some storage on your device, and you can start earning file point and source of, uh, files for other individuals. What's really cool is like we start thinking about Casper. Um, who here knows about proof of stake? Proof of work? Fair number of people. Okay, cool. So one of the things with proof of stake is you have to constantly make these signatures all the time, every handful of seconds. Now, before last week, that was like a repair signature and a commit signature, but I think Vitalik has dropped it down to, to one type of message type for Vitalik. Um, but either way, like you need to make signatures on a very regular basis. If you go offline, you stop making signatures, you start earning a negative interest rate. So we don't want that to happen. So you need an always online device that's able to make signatures in a secure way. I personally don't want to put my private keys on Microsoft Azure or AWS, so I likely won't want to run Casper um, in a cloud setting. So it'd be really cool if you could run it like based on our agent device. Just we can keep going. Oh, wait, we should take questions. Yeah, so I just want to mention one last thing. Um, they kind of extend on that last slide, and that is that what we're doing is we're putting cryptocurrency into the hands of people on a broad basis, they don't necessarily need to know that they're using it, and we're doing it in a way that it's secure and robust. What we really think we're doing, though, is electricity is one potential application of many applications to come, and that we're actually building a critical infrastructural piece for other distributed ledger technologies, and really Web 3.0 generally, which can only succeed if you have truly distributed uh, systems running uh, these ledgers. So this is our current team. Uh, and then the last thing I just want to mention is we're in the process of a token sale. And uh, we finished up our pre-sale just recently. The token sale will be uh, the end of this month. If anyone has any questions about it, they can go to our website or they can uh, talk to one of us afterwards.
So, um, for consumers, it will be first rolling out at the mass market. I uh, mentioned in a few months, right? No, Q2, Q3 Q2, next year. Q2, yeah. Q2 2018. Okay. And you mentioned they may not know they're um, actually buying a solution that's based on blockchain. Is that right? If we're successful, yeah. Correct. So that won't be part of your sales pitch, though. It'll be you want 35 to 40 percent savings on your electricity. 35 to 40 percent savings on your electricity, and um, and it's basically you know I get this device in my home, it will magically give me 35 percent to 40 percent savings, but then. Um, what will be the reason to believe, if, if, if you don't want to mention it's blockchain based, what will be the reason to believe that uh, you're delivering this uh, savings to me? And this is actually going to make smart real time decisions for me. From the consumer standpoint? Right, from, from your marketing consumer standpoint. Uh, no one's going to ask any questions from a consumer standpoint, right? They'll just right. be like, oh, my bill is 35% cheaper. Right. They're so going to be happy. Or just show the proof that you're in your yeah. building. Yeah? Okay. All right. Yeah. Questions. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, you were mentioning about the savings, but what is the cost of the agent? Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. So they need to pay basically to get fifty dollars. Um, but the other question is uh, maybe I need something that uh, since the AO solution is based on Ethereum. At the moment, we buy energy from uh, uh, one single supplier, and uh, we basically have a contract and uh, we pay them. In future, where there will be a distributed and decentralized energy market, there will be an explosion of suppliers and transactions that happen in real time. How does this, how do you cope with this and with Ethereum that can only manage? a very extremely limited number of transactions in the same How do you manage to work through it? Yeah, so there's <laughs> two questions there. Uh, one, one is about the, essentially the market, sorry, the electricity market. So the, the first one is, uh, you have this wholesale market, and then you have essentially the consumers and, and the retailers, the intermediary. If you're using blockchain, um, and you eliminate a lot of the need for the, the financial intermediate the retailer, over time, what our goal is, is not just to serve residential energy customers, but is to actually move this up in the value stack, such that this is also being used in the wholesale markets. If you do that, you could actually have the consumer and the generators all trading seamlessly in the same market. But more interestingly, you can always create this hub-spoke topology and use what uh, Mark was talking about uh, with state channels, and that a customer opens a state channel, right? So they're escrowing funds off-chain and they're trading it uh, essentially in a zero-cost way with one counterparty back and forth. And at any point in time, either one of those counterparties can collapse that transaction back to chain, but they can do an infinite number off chain with, with literally or very close to zero cost. And just to add to that point, if you think Ethereum's 13 or so transactions per second now is what it's going to be a few years from now, like, like we would have failed as far as Ethereum is concerned. There is a very robust roadmap as far as scalability and how we're going to move to a place where we have configurable privacy and essentially everything we'll need to build something like this um, and, and generally scale it uh, to the entire world. We could actually do everything that we want to do in current state Ethereum now with the Grid Plus platform, but by the time we're live, we'll actually probably have you know better updates anyway. I would strongly recommend researching Plasma, a white paper released by Vitalik and Joseph Poon. Um, it's really good. It shows the idea of nesting chains within the actual like root blockchain. Um, it gives a higher level of scalability, utilizing fraud proofs to ensure no one closes you out and kind of loses your funds uh, anytime early. But yeah, we can talk about the roadmap afterwards. Um, and also you can check out Alex Miller's um, unidirectional simple payment channel um, GitHub repository. So the technology is existing today for simple payment channels uh, that are off chain. Yeah, and just to that point, Alex Miller, he's the lead uh, Solidity developer on Grid Plus. He says it's going to be his mission to make Grid Plus the first Plasma platform, uh, Plasma enabled platform out there. So, 
soon to come. The race is on. <laughs> And I'm kind of fascinated by the concept of bolt. If I understand you correctly, there's no way for me as a consumer that I can get hold of the bolt. There's no way for me to, to transfer it to my own system. You, you, or is there? No, you can, once they're in your possession, they're in your seats, one, and you can do whatever you want with them. Right, but then you actually created a permissionless. A beautiful, a beautiful stable coin on the network, which I will be super excited for people to use in platforms like Gnosis. That's interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome so, to Web3. And, and, and regulatory implications? Because you're creating digital cash uh, with no KYC? Uh, uh, no, definitely not. So every <laughs> single person who's on our platform is fully KYC. We are a utility. We have to go through very robust KYC AML to sign up any customers to our platform. Okay, so you wind this every address holding? We, we know every single person who is doing this because we know the address, right, for the agent device is associated with you who's a customer of our utility. Yeah. And if my address is not known in your platform, you cannot transfer the bolt to me. Well, yeah, no, we wouldn't create, so the bolts are created and destroyed, right, by Grid Plus. Bolts are created when one of our customers sends us prepaid money for energy. Bolts are destroyed when they consume, when their agent device sends us bolts after using energy, their smart meter updates, and that's when we, we burn them. If whatever you do with your bolts is, you know, it's on your own, I, I don't really care, um, but we only, we only take them and redeem them from our customers. Yeah. Okay, but I can use it for hypnosis, so I can also use it for safe markets, so that you can restore these markets. We, 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 we can't really speculate to sort of secondary use markets. The one thing I do want to say in terms of regulation, though, is in Texas, a retail energy provider, per regulation, if a customer takes a deposit or puts a deposit with that company, those funds have to be held in a segregated cash account that's insured and audited. So uh, the bolt that we issue will be fully collateralized all the time by regulation. We'll do couple Yeah. So speaking about regulations and how those uh, aspects of work within the economy, there's a lot of pressure with the generators against people who have solar generation, like myself, like six kilowatts yep. on my mother's house. And the legislation in Utah continually gets more aggressive against people like me. And I'm more incentivized to disconnect from the grid completely because I don't want to deal with their regulations and their menial payback that they want to give me. And of course, there's other aspects of like uh, uh, cross-state commerce and the energy market's totally different. But there's been a lot of aggression in the past in the United States where they penalize people who produce their own resources because they're not purchasing resources from the market. Have you considered these aspects? Yeah, so that's, um, it, it depends what market. I believe Utah is not a deregulated state, it's a regulated state, so they can pretty much do what they want, whenever they want, and there's not much you can do about it except uh, disconnect from the grid. In, in a deregulated market, there's this, this force of market discovery. Now that, that force of market discovery is not perfect, obviously, and that in, uh, you know, in terms of uh, actually having consumers pay prices relative to uh, you know supply and demand, which is one thing that we're introducing, uh, but it's also not perfect in essentially uh, uh, penalizing the solar producers in some ways for the externalities that they're incurring on the other actors in the grid. See, the only way that you can disconnect and self-consume is if you have solar plus a battery. And you actually need a battery that would probably last, I think, three days if you wanted, say, 98% reliability. You would need something last, I think, 14 days if you want 99.5% reliability. And if you want 100%, you need a month of, of energy storage. So you're, you're not really going to want to uh, sort of detach from the grid. But what we're doing is we're putting the financial infrastructure in place. And, and we're hopefully creating more market-driven incentives and market-based rewards for resources that people are putting on the grid. So you're going to hopefully more fairly remunerate people for what they're actually contributing. And it's Grid Plus. Oh, okay. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, she's, she's been there. Yeah, oh. Maybe we get to one, one more. Yeah. Sniped there. 
Um, I'd also like to thank you for your talk. Um, I'm very, I, I'm very interested in your um, your proposal for a naive user interface and for integrating with uh, existing infrastructure. I think it's a very realistic uh, plan of entry. I do have some questions about uh, price incentives and price signaling. Uh, so in the past, when gas is cheap, people tend to buy, you know, more gas sensors. So if I'm, I'm all for removing this you know, completely morally reprehensible layer of markup, yes, but if energy prices are to be lowered to such a degree, how is that going to in increase incentives for prosumer behavior? So, so I think it actually increases incentives because the greatest example and what we really need on the grid to enable more intermittent generation, which is largely renewables, is batteries. And right now, in many markets, there is zero or negative incentive to actually put a battery on the grid, but the grid desperately needs it if we want to continue to push uh, penetration of intermittent renewable production past 20 or 30 percent. And so the way that we incentivize that is because there's price variation during the day, if I have a battery, I can now, say, charge that battery at night when energy is very, very cheap, and I can sell it back into the grid at peak. I'm also actually likely charging it with energy that's being generated by solar, or sorry, wind producers. And because I'm doing that, I'm actually incentivizing more wind production. So uh, by ex essentially exposing the, the consumers to more market-based pricing, you are incentivizing the most economically efficient technologies, which today, if you truly look at the costs, are renewables and, and storage. Yeah, more use of batteries uh, is uh, definitely going to make a big change to the picture. Uh, maybe one more question, and uh, I'll go to one new person. We'll have time afterwards. Uh, there, they'll, they'll be available for questions as well. Just to make sure that I understand correctly, um, if we strip away the buzzwords, it's basically you make your money selling. Uh, energy because you can make better profit on the wholesale than retail, right? That's how you make money. You, yeah, you have lower margin. You have lower margin. Between you have lower yeah. margin. Okay. But, um, like, I don't know if you're looking at Europe or the Netherlands, but um, in the Netherlands, the tariffs are coming. Uh, 24 cents. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I think six, 6 cents is just the production cost yeah. versus tariffs. Yeah. 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 But it sounds like. Um, the, the, the Texan energy market is uh, not really competitive because if you strip away AI, blockchain, whatever, um, what does a big energy provider stop from competing with you and just lowering the prices? Because they can do exactly the same you are. <coughs> so how do you compete with uh, a big energy company if they just understand, oh shit, now we have a competitor seriously doing something. They are more efficient in yeah, for the whole world. Yeah. Whereas they basically can just lower the, the, lower the prices. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's a good question, right? So if you look at essentially retail electricity providers in Texas, the rates that they're charging is essentially the equilibrium price point that they can charge uh, in a sustainable way based off of the current technologies and the way that they act as credit facilities in, in financial hedging intermediaries between the consumers and the wholesale markets. What we're proposing is a different topology where we introduce blockchain such that we eliminate the bad debts, uh, we don't have those hedging administrative costs, uh, and we just expose the consumers to those uh, pricing so that we can actually deliver it at a cheaper rate. Mark one thing. Well, I don't know, you want to yeah. 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 So, I mean, we are also running on the hypothesis that Yes, it's a buzzword, but that blockchain technology provides a more efficient financial layer for digitally native assets. Um, and so if the utilities start adopting blockchain technology in order to compete with our competitive advantage, then that is a wholesale win across the board. That was going to be my answer. So if we're put out of business because a bigger entity does what we're doing better, like then that's better for all the consumers anyway. That's fine. Okay. Well, that's... Uh... Yep.
Unfortunately, they're not known to speak some of these energy companies. So, um, <laughs> thanks very much, uh, and we have one more. Uh,